Welcome to Terrible Lizards, a podcast about dinosaurs with Dr. David Home and Izzy Lawrence. On this week's episode, we answer your questions from famous Triassic dinosaurs to what film got it right. It's the last episode in the current series, but we'll be back soon. And if you're desperate, there will be more dinosaur content to be had via Patreon. Hello and welcome to episode 8 of Terrible Lizards. Now, this episode is all about where Dave went wrong. That is... <laughs> That's a big lie and you know it. Only the first half is where Dave went wrong. Well, it depends how long you consider half. This is the end of season one. Is it a series or is it, or is it a season? We need to decide this, Dave. We're, we're British, it's a series. Okay, this is series one. <laughs> this is the end of it, but we will be back and we will give you all the information about the secret goings on that we're going to do over the summer as well. So if you need your lizards and you need them to be terrible, there will be stuff happening. But um, for the time being, quite a lot of you have sent us some questions. So we're going to get to um, your questions but only after Dave apologises for all the errors. Because we haven't had an errors, you know, beginning with an errors for ages now. So I think we need to. Yes. Okay. <laughs> so do you want to talk to me about the Bushman? Yeah. So uh, apologies if I mangle your name. Uh, Anarchy Showman emailed me. Um, and so, yeah, I think all the way back in episode one for T-Rex, talked about their long distance pursuit predator strategy and talked about how there is a human group that does this which is the Bushmen of the Kalahari and um, she is emailing from South Africa and this apparently is an inappropriate term I have been reassured that it is not offensive but it is not the term that should be used correctly to be fair there are lots of pedants who listen to this and you'd be better off being offensive than being incorrect now (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Talking of, Darren Nash has been in touch um, a lot on the Twitter. We seem to be getting quite a few like debates going on Twitter, which is great. Well, we're talking about endotherms and you've got something wrong. So Darren, for people who don't know, is a paleontologist. He's an old friend and colleague of mine. We've published some papers together and we're working on some stuff at the moment together as well, actually, um, and runs his own successful podcast oh, called Tetrapod Zoology. Don't, don't advertise it, for Yeah, no, sake. I know, but I know he'll moan if I don't. <laughs> <laughs> um, Darren pointed out a couple of things about the physiology stuff that we did, um, mostly in the Diplodocus episode, but I think we touched on some other bits as well. In particular, the gigantothermy, homeothermy, or thermal inertia, where things that are really big tend to be pretty bad at shedding heat because they've got a relatively small surface area and a relatively big volume. And I mentioned some things that we definitely know do that, so things like some big crocodiles do this. And I also said uh, that things like like some of the big sharks and tuna do that. And Darren picked me up and said, actually, some of them at least are, or all of them are true endotherms. That is, they are actively generating their own heat. It's not a case of them just not shedding their heat. So yeah, and similarly, I talked about um, the bigger sauropods basically running off thermal inertia. uh, And he says that's probably not true. I I thought my take on that was fairly mainstream. It turns out it's fairly niche and I hadn't realised that because... Uh You can't read every bit of all the literature on everything and keep up to date with it. And clearly the sauropod physiology literature has got past me. We had um, one of our patrons, um, the people who support us on Patreon, um, called Eric. Now, he got in touch and wanted to know more about this, but we were thinking we're going to have a sort of really in-depth episode about it, weren't we? Yeah, so the plan for this episode is mostly to try and answer people's questions, and we were going to give preference to our Patreons, but yeah, Eric asked a whole bunch of questions about physiology which we'd already planned to do in a special episode. So unfortunately, it seems a bit redundant to cover it all now. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, if, if that's the plan. But I think he inspired us to, to do it. So thank you very much, Eric, for that. Yeah, it was definitely on the list of things we wanted to cover as a whole episode, probably in the next series. But I think we've now bumped it up to a priority for our for our specials. Yeah, well, this is the thing. You see, uh, we kind of, we kind of, I was going to announce We're ahead the of end ourselves, of, Exactly. Yeah. I was going to say, oh, Big announcement. But the, the plan is, we're going to do is we're going to have deep dive episodes which are available to our patrons in the gaps in between the series. So you'll be the next series will be out in September sometime. But during the summer, there'll be some really intense deep dive science-y episodes for those of you who really need your dinosaurs and need, need to you know swat up on it. We'll get those if you become patrons. Go to Patreon. All the details will be at the end of the show. They're also all on our website. So anyway, let's move on. Let's 
let's talk ceratopians and why they're hungry. So when we did the Triceratops episode, I mentioned that there's loads of them in North America and there's loads of them in Asia and Asia was just as connected to Europe now as it was then. And it's kind of weird that we don't really have any Ceratopsians in Europe. And I mentioned that there is a tooth, I think, uh, and that is our kind of sole hint that we did actually have Ceratopsians in Europe, but for some reason we just can't find them and they're super rare. And yes, Darren Nation again reminded me that there is actually a European Ceratopsian from Hungary, um, Ajka Ceratops, so A-J-K-A Ceratops, uh, which I had just, I knew about and had just completely forgotten. Yes, there is a European Ceratopsian, though equally it really doesn't undermine my point, which is they should be absolutely everywhere in Europe because they're everywhere in Asia and North America. In fact, if anything, it makes it worse because now we do definitively know they're in Europe. So where the bloody hell are they all? Uh, It's very, very odd still. Maybe they just died in really awkward places that got eroded. Fell down the back of the sofa. So yeah, Yeah. they're really hard to really hard to get them out. Now only like literally the week that we put out our reproductive episode with Richard Herring. And we talked about dinosaur eggs and all their shapes and forms. And then suddenly I'm reading New Scientist and they're talking about leathery eggs, the proto eggs. Why did we cover this? Annoyingly, this paper and then all the media coverage of it came out about three days before the reproduction episode dropped, which, of course, we'd recorded weeks earlier. I mentioned it on Twitter and went, we didn't get anything wrong, but we missed a really obvious brand new super sexy thing from a few days ago because, well, we recorded this like four weeks ago. (laughs) So, yeah, so paper describing in particular a bunch of eggs from uh, Mongolia, uh, but some others, too, from other places like South America, if I remember correctly, of several different dinosaur groups which were leathery for want of a better term so we we normally kind of separate out reptile eggs into two types one of which is a relatively hard egg so like a bird's egg you know you've got that on a pan and you want to crack it you know you've actually got to physically bash it and break the shell and that's the egg type that we normally think the dinosaurs as having and then a more leathery one which are obviously still quite strong because they've got to hold together but they are a little bit pliable a squidgy and that term leather is is you know a really good one for that point of view tortoises and turtles um, snakes most snakes and lizards and indeed most crocodiles have something like that now that's an oversimplification there are harder and softer versions of the softer shelled eggs but as a basic split that's that's all we need right now and we generally assumed that all of the dinosaurs are on the hard side somewhere between a chicken egg and a and a, like tadpole like um egg spawn <laughs> you'll get a you'll get a dinosaur leathery yeah they're a bit they're a bit more solid than that and yeah if you've ever seen videos of in particular things like turtles laying eggs you know and they'll be the big sea turtles you know and they drop loads of eggs out into ping pong balls yeah right in into the and you can see them kind of like bounce and stick and they, they get squidged a bit and the sides like dent in but they won't break or crack because yeah they've got some pliability to them we thought of the dinosaurs as having hard shelled eggs and now we've got definitive soft shelled eggs for dinosaurs and importantly it looks like like this is an actually early trait, an ancestral trait, which actually kind of makes sense because we definitely know that pterosaurs had a leathery egg and crocodiles have a leathery egg. Um, And so probably the early ancestral condition now looks like it was a leathery one. And how far that spreads up various different lineages is now, of course, a big, big question because these softer ones are obviously going to be less good at preserving. So we've always assumed in the past that at least part of the reason we don't find a whole bunch of these eggs is because animals that lay eggs in places which are very likely to be buried and destroyed probably don't last (laughs) very long and so eggs are probably turning up in places that don't fossilize well now it turns out of course that a probably even bigger contributing factor is the fact that soft-shelled eggs we just don't preserve as well as hard-shelled eggs so the reason we're not finding these eggs for large swathes of dinosaurs is because they're very very poor preservational potential and of course now there's the possibility that we've been finding nests of them and then assuming that they're something else because of course dinosaurs have hard shelled eggs and you found a fossil soft shelled egg it can't have been a dinosaur can you get a fossil shot soft oh gosh that's hard to say soft shelled egg a fossil soft shelled egg goodness that's hard <laughs> yeah they do turn up again in exactly the right 
circumstances, but they're super rare. For example, for pterosaurs, um, so one incident aside, so there's been a recent discovery in uh, northwest China, which has produced dozens, if not hundreds of them. So a very narrow layer where preservation is just spot on. We found like three in 300 years. Wow. And all of them, all of them came post about 2005. So... <laughs> Pretty yeah, rare. So- soft-shelled eggs don't turn up in huge numbers. Dinosaurs probably had a soft-shelled egg ancestrally. That means we're missing loads of them because they don't preserve well, and it means that there's some very different things going on with their reproductive biology. Yeah, I was going to say, how how do you know that you've got a soft a soft-shelled egg? Because I mean, but it could look like a coprolite. It could look like anything. Yeah, so so often they are squidged up. I've I've seen these in the field, so I I have seen what I'm pretty sure are soft-shelled eggs of turtles and tortoises and, and crocodiles and stuff and yeah they, they tend to be kind of scrunched up and, and wrinkly um, because they will deform far more readily than will a hard shelled egg but yeah as I say we've almost certainly mistaken stuff in the past I, mean, I think something people really need to do almost immediately is go and reappraise where we've got big soft shelled eggs that people have assumed to be a large crocodile or something like that might well now be dinosaur I'm going to move on to one of our questions now this is um, by a man called Andy Riley yeah. he's asked a couple of questions i think we're gonna ask one of them okay i think that question is going to be where are all the famous triassic dinosaur celebrities because like there's jurassic park but even in jurassic park they're all from the cretaceous mainly yeah mostly exactly so the main dinosaurs all the celebrity ones we can think of the ones we talked about you know when we talked about triceratops we talked about diplodocus and we talked about t-rex and stuff they're all sort of cretaceous really yeah and we've got a few from the jurassic which Ooh, celebrities but yeah name me a dinosaur from the triassic how come they're not you know yeah so so the the two that you're most likely to have heard of but again they're neither particularly famous are coelophysis uh and plateosaurus coelophysis is the coolest though right yeah coelophysis yeah, is a cool but, animal um <laughs> but yeah so but it's yeah it's a it's a great question and yeah even even we have you know somewhat deliberately focused on some of the more famous ones to, to kick off but yeah we the triassic doesn't get much of a look in and i think there's several reasons for that the most obvious one is that there's not that many dinosaurs from the Triassic so the Triassic is split into three periods early middle and late dinosaurs are only known from the late Triassic there's some that might be from the middle depending on the exact dating and we I think most people think that dinosaur ancestry probably goes back to the middle Triassic we just haven't found any quite that old yet Um, they're certainly hovering around that margin but they're only appearing in the last period anyway and that's not particularly long and they're not the dominant group by any stretch of the imagination there are lots of other reptiles that are as big or bigger than most dinosaurs in the Triassic. Um, right. So not just things that you might recognise like pterosaurs and crocodiles and turtles, but things like Rauisuchians, which are like giant predatory quadrupedal animals who have a head that looks a bit like Allosaurus. There's the... What? E- <laughs> yes, there's the Eatosaurs, <gasps> A-E-T-O saurs, which basically are very similar to Ankylosaurs. They're these squat armoured things. They're a Phytosaurs which despite their name are extremely crocodile like they're basically modern crocodile analogs they do very similar things in very similar ways and a whole bunch of other lineages as well and so it's not like it's dinosaur 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 they're a fairly small section of the fauna and they're mostly not very big and of course in terms of what people are really interested in they're interested in big cool interesting weird dinosaurs and those haven't got going yet currently we have no ornithisians from the triassic We we just don't have any at all and then for the we've only got I think two very low numbers of true sauropods so that is the you know the really big ones but most we've got the sauropod ancestors which is what used to be called prosauropods because they came before the sauropods uh, or more properly are non-sauropod non-sauropod and sauropodomorphs um, <gasps> but yeah I know horrible bit of jargon okay hang on hang on non-sauropod sauropod non-sauropod sauropodomorphs so the non-sauropod sauropodomorphs yes I love that so the overall group is the sauropod Sauropod and Morpho. Yeah. You know, so basically sauropod shaped. So all things from that group. But these ones aren't sauropod shaped. But yeah, but within that group, we have the true sauropods, which is your Diplodocus type stuff. And therefore, if you want to cut the bottom off, you effectively have to say, it's you know, think of it as a big Venn diagram. Yeah. And basically you're saying the bit inside the big group but outside the large group within that bigger group. Oh my goodness. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's a big, it's a big mess. But it, the point is you ha- you've got 
got like two sauropods and then it's all for convenience it's like pro sauropods so these are things which are still fairly similar but they're mostly bipedal so they're walking on their back legs Mm -hmm. but they still got a big long neck and they still got little head and they're still plant eaters and basically they get bigger and bigger and move on to all fours and basically then have true sauropods at that okay so the reason we don't have famous triassic dinosaurs is that they're not very big or very exciting looking and they've got silly names like (laughs) i'm I'm sorry but anything that c-o-e is just not a good coelophysis it's hard it's hard to see yeah but it's not spelt seal is it it's spelt it's spelt (laughs) coil but what i want to know and i think a lot of people listening who aren't paleontologists want to know is you've got you know you describe all these other creatures that are alive at the time that are a bit crocodilian but how can you tell the difference between a crocodilian fossil and a dinosaur fossil what makes a dinosaur fossil a dinosaur so what makes a dinosaur a dinosaur um i'd really want to go back and check some of the most recent papers about exact definitions but basically we're looking for a few key anatomical features which we see in dinosaurs and don't see any in anything else and it, this is actually this is worth talking about so this is something that people often get wrong and get backwards so what we do as i was gonna say as paleontologists but biologists doing it trying to one of the things we do is try and reconstruct what we call the tree of life so in other words the evolution relationships of ultimately all things um living and extinct and for dinosaurs at least because we don't have things like dna preserved and we don't have things like really good data on physiology is we just look at anatomical features on the skeleton because it's basically all we've got to go on and so we look at these in enormous detail i mean hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of characters you know four or five hundred characters is now pretty normal for an analysis and by characters you mean you mean just like something about the bone or shaped in a certain way yeah often really quite subtle details of the anatomy so what's the ratio of the length of this bone to that bone in the arm or does it have a little spur of bone on this arm if it does have a little bit of spur of bone on that bone is it on the front side or is it on the back side (laughs) if it's on the back side is it long or is it short or is it curve over and on and on and on and on and on across the skeleton and of course again with dinosaurs we've got loads of gaps because we don't have whole skeletons often but basically we shove all of that into a computer program and it will tell us which things are closest to each other in other words which things have the most things in common Uh, this is something I learned to do by hand as an undergraduate because the computing power wasn't up to it um whereas now once you're into the hundreds of characters and dozens of species yeah you you can't do this by hand do you know what this sounds like to an outsider it sounds like you've gone out to somebody's garden and you've looked at a tree and you've basically waited for the leaves to fall off and then you've put them in the height order up the tree that you can get by the size of the leaves and the way that they're developed and everything it must make you crazy (laughs) Yeah, it does, particularly when you start finding mistakes <laughs> and stuff isn't held together very well. Oh, but no. ultimately, you know, your computer program should spit out a family tree and it will say these things are related to each other, these things are related to each other, and all these things form a group, and all these things form a group, and this is somewhere between the two, and you get odd things and you go, we're not quite sure where this goes because there's lots of bit missing or it has weird anatomy and it could go here or it could go here. Yadda, 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 yadda. But we'd look at all of that and go, right, we have a general agreement. There is a line here and everything above this line is a dinosaur and everything below this line is not a dinosaur. Okay. And then what we do is we look at everything or the ancestral condition of everything at that junction, formerly a node for which we've written dinosaur next to it and go, right, what features do all of these animals have in common that the other things don't have? And that is ultimately what effectively defines a dinosaur. Um, And people often get that backwards and think that we pick the anatomical characters and that that's how it did, it's defined but it's not we, we look at what the grouping is and then take the characters from that um, and so the one that I always remember because I don't work right down at the base of the dinosaur tree because <laughs> it's really complicated and you've got all these transitions um, so it's the delta pectoral crest of the humerus is at least 20% of the length of the humerus nice so that's that's one that's always stuck in my head I hope it's still valid and if it's not don't bother to correcting me because it's, <laughs> it's an exemplar not necessarily <laughs> definitive so if you're humerus your upper arm bone in dinosaurs or many reptiles there is a basic little flange that 
would point forward. So if you're standing facing, you know, just facing straight ahead with your arms by your side and your palms flat against your thighs, there'd be a little bit of bone about half, about a third of the way down your humerus mm. pointing forward. A little, a little flange, basically, a little rectangle of bone. And in dinosaurs, that's quite big. So it is at least 20% of the length of the humerus. So in other words, if you measured the height of that, so the long edge of that rectangle, and you measured the total length of the humerus, it would be at least 20%. And so that is, or at least certainly used to be, one characteristic which we knew was unique to dinosaurs and not present in any non-dinosaurs. And therefore, therefore, if you find a skeleton and it's got that, you could go dinosaur, even if you didn't have anything else. Even even if it could, because it could be like, you could have somebody with like, you know, some sort of terrible growth there or something. Anyway, but let's not go there. Let's yeah, go. Is it, right. And, and then, you know, there are odd exceptions to things. So but the, that's, that's part of the problem because evolution does weird things. So, you know, we have a group called tetrapods, the four limbed animals. And that is frogs and newts and reptiles and birds and dinosaurs and mammals. Only snakes are tetrapods. <laughs> they have no legs or they've got two tiny stumpy legs. There's all kinds of amphibians that have reduced or get rid of their legs. And then there's the legless lizards. They're still tetrapods. There's whales. Yeah, and whales. Ancestrally, they had four legs. The original state of that group was to have four legs. So its absence doesn't mean that there's something wrong with the definition or that those suddenly are magically not tetrapods and are fish. It's just that evolution does really awkward, annoying things and you'd like it to <laughs> keep bloody data where it should be. And it doesn't like doing that. Um, yeah, there's, there's all kinds of little things like that that go on all the time. You're basically just trying to tidy up the natural world, aren't you? Into some sort of order. Well, ultimately, so, so a big question we get all the time is how do you know what's a new species? And I've taught whole classes on this and the answer is it's really not easy at all and it's always going to be subjective because evolution by definition is ongoing. You know, the human population that is alive today, not a single person here was alive 150 years ago and none of them were alive 150 years before that. None of them were alive 150 years before that. So there's a continuum that you literally can't observe and can't maintain. Uh, And it's not that we go through a new, you know, every human is a new species every 150 years because there's no one alive anymore. But clearly there has been change generation by generation. And so to make anything of biology, we kind of need some discrete units. And the discrete unit that we use is the species. Usually there are some, there are subspecies. We talk about populations for certain things, but basically a species. But ultimately what you're doing is making an artificial line on a continuum. And the example I always give is, you know, get a color swatch, get one of those, um, grades when you're when you've got like one of the little paint programs in your computer you know and it's you know yellow on one side and red on the other and it's very easy to look on the left and go there's yellow and on the right there's red but there's an orange bit in the middle somewhere where it's not yellow anymore but not quite red and then it's clearly not bit reddier but it's still not red yet right all we're doing is dropping a line down there and going this side is yellow and this side is red regardless of whether or not it's that clean um and often it is that clean because again we're looking at if you're looking at things like lions and tigers you know they've been separated for a couple of million years but a couple of million years ago it'd probably be extremely hard to tell them apart whereas now it's quite easy because they're very obviously distinct and they can still breed so you can get ligers well right and then you've and then they hybridize but they don't hybridize properly because they don't have fertile offspring but there are that there are things which are way more disparately related to each other which can hybridize i mean plants hybridize readily across what you would term families my understanding is virtually any orchid can reproduce with virtually any other orchid even though they're an enormously diverse set of plants um yeah and then you get i mean plants are in particular a complete nightmare for their hybridization though we're getting yeah let's let's get, let's get back on to some questions okay so <laughs> I, i'm gonna keep order uh so um now son of gav he wants to know because we did we talked about you know how you can find fossils with bite marks in and how you can see mm. you know how bones have been broken and that sort of things while the animals were alive but but what do we know about diseases and health problems that dinosaurs were able to get? Are there any evidence of diseases? Yeah, there are. Um, they're hard to tell apart because, again, huge numbers of diseases can affect your skeleton, but most diseases don't. And even the ones that do, you can have very different diseases that produce very similar responses when they get 
get down and actually affect the bone. So we do see pathological bones, so bones with signs of infection and and or healing. Um, and people have diagnosed various illnesses, including things like arthritis and cancer and other stuff like this. Uh, some of those are, I think, pretty confident. Some of those, I think, are extremely loose and actually really hard to say. Plus, bear in mind, it's not like we have a really great handle on all of the pathological uh, affections of bones that we get in things like modern birds and reptiles. So, you know, you'd want a really good handle on them before you even started applying it to dinosaurs. And yeah, like we've done a really good study of all the bone damage that you can get to 10,000 bird species and another 6,000 rep- 7,000 reptile species, whatever it is. It's going to be very rough and ready. But yeah, totally normal to see evidence of injuries and evidence of diseases and damage to the bones. There's some fairly controversial ones. So there are a whole bunch of tyrannosaurs that have holes pretty much in the lower jaw. Ooh. There's a there's a parasite that basically you get in modern birds of prey uh, and it drills holes through the bone in the jaw and it has been suggested that this is floating around in something similar as floating around in tyrannosaurs. I have to say I was really very unconvinced by that paper when it first came out and a couple of years ago I got to see Sue the famous giant T-Rex that's in Chicago and Sue was one of the kind of exemplar specimens and I'd always assumed that these were probably something else and I didn't really believe paper if I'm entirely honest and having had a good look at Sue firsthand they're definitely not bite marks which is what I thought they'd been mistaken yeah. as um, they really don't look like tyrannosaur bite marks um, and the healing patterns do not look like tyrannosaur bite marks I'm still not 100% convinced that these are the same kind of parasite if nothing else because it'd be kind of weird if they only showed up in tyrannosaurs and in none of the other carnivorous dinosaurs I'm increasingly increasingly of a mind that this is actually a, it is a disease centric manifestation on the bones that we're seeing or dave 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 what well, it could be right what well, it could be right? <laughs> uh oh yes go on bullet holes <sighs> yes the time travelers were trying to shoot their uh... yes Yes, well, they succeeded, obviously, because it died. Yeah, you don't, not really seeing the fracturing pattern that you'd expect with anything oh, sure, that could knock a hole everything. in your jawbone. You ruined yeah. everything. Okay, okay. Sorry. Moving Sorry. on Sorry. to Mustn't another question. Uh, but how about we um, answer Kath Gale's question? Because she wants to know more about the evidence for behaviours in dinosaurs. Um, how do you show one behaviour is more likely than another? Um, yeah, with, with some difficulty. Um, I should add that Kath, I've known for many years. Oh, we really? Were undergraduates together at, um, at Bristol Uni. Yeah, she's a fellow biologist. Oh, is she trying to catch you out? Is this, is this you know... Is I she hope trying not. To... <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think we still get on. Yeah, how, how do we tell behaviour? We talked about... About some bits of that so we talked about things like head posture and tooth shape and stuff like this can, can tell you certain things um, you get data for things like footprints can give you a hint how fast things are running um, or whether or not they could swim and digital models will tell you whether or not they could float which then might tell you about something like how they swim or whether or not could swim things like stomach contents what they've been eating or where bite marks appear on bones you can start building up patterns of data to show what stuff has been doing and depending on quite what you're looking at trying to lump all these different things together that and of course looking at living things as well and trying to build these patterns up uh, but it's often very hard to get from yeah two things that are fairly equal as it were and say which one is more likely than the other and you've got this kind of trade-off whereby fossilization is a really rare process we just don't have many fossils uh, and you know it's, it's a very exceptional thing and therefore when you find a random fossil that happens to exhibit something really interesting and informative maybe it's got stomach contents so you found an animal and it's got stomach contents and it's really not what you expected it's really tempting to say well fossils are so rare that the odds that this animal happened to have died just after it did something really rare and weird and unusual is really unlikely so this probably represents really genuine evidence of normal behavior in this group or it could just be there's an insane dinosaur that went around eating stones and it had nothing to do with digestion it just loved the taste of stones and that's how it died <laughs> Yeah, or it died in a river with its mouth open and stuff washed it. Right, but the flip side is really rare exceptional things happen occasionally. And if you've only ever got one example, how confident are you that that's quite genuine? So a great example of this, um, and apologies to anyone who's heard this before because I mentioned this on another podcast the other day, uh, is the little dinosaur Microraptor. So Microraptor is a little feathered dinosaur from China. We've 
got loads of specimens of it. And um, my, there was a specimen of Microraptor found with a bird inside it. And everyone went, oh, Microraptor was hunting birds. And then a colleague of mine was over and looking at um, an actually quite an old Microraptor specimen. He went, uh, there's a mammal foot inside it, trapped between the ribs with a bitten off foot. Wow. So Microraptor ate mammals and birds. And then someone found a Microraptor with fish inside it. And then someone else found a Microraptor with a lizard inside it. And so we've gone from Microraptor ate birds to Microraptor ate basically everything in three more fossils. And of course, now we're in a, right, did Microraptor actually eat everything or was was the fish one really weird or was the bird one really <laughs> weird or was the lizard one really weird or have we actually got two different species of microraptor but we haven't realized it or were the babies eating fish and the adults were eating birds or is that bird just a complete one-off because it just happened to find a dead one so it ate it and they'd never normally and you don't know probably it's reasonable to infer that microraptor has quite a diverse diet but it's an exact case in point where if you took us any one of those single data points you would make a gross over estimate in the narrowness and specificity of the diet and so repeated data points for behavior as far as i'm concerned is where it's really at if we find if the next three or four microraptors that we find with stomach contents all have lizards and mammals in them then i think we'd be pretty confident that actually lizards and mammals and small terrestrial animals are the main diet that's the last thing you want to find as a paleontologist is something oh we found this exactly before great find woohoo that's really disappointing (laughs) yes and no because it's that it's that it's that confirmation you know we have the same problem in all fields of science you know we we talk about the the replication problem is that people do really big expensive complicated studies and get a really interesting result but there's always the chance that that happened through a whole bunch of random events completely outside of our understanding because there was something else going on that we didn't measure or didn't understand or whatever and if we never do that experiment again we won't know and of course because it was a big long complicated and clever experiment that cost a lot of money no one really wants to do it again when they're pretty sure that the answer is right um and it's kind of the same thing here yes you want to find the first thing that shows x but in some ways if you want to have real confidence that that's correct finding another three examples of that is going to do you a lot more good in that sense right okay so after ralph Athanasia wanted to know about cheeks and stuff harry butler another one of our patrons go on harry Mm -hmm. um he also wants to know because chris packham you know wanted to know what did t-rex sound like it was a deep rumbling low frequency roar how accurate was that but also we've got other questions by Dave um, Hempfrich Bennett, and he wants to know which group of dinosaurs were loudest, and if we can think they could sing. I was thinking you could also combine this with John's question about have films ever portrayed dinosaurs correctly because we know in Jurassic Park there's that thing where they blow through the throat and control the velociraptors etc so this is all a big question of what did they sound like please tell me they tweeted and there's yeah and there's another Dave on Twitter um who asked did they roar yeah Let, let's do let's deal with roaring so roaring in the sense that crocodiles and alligators alligators in particular make a noise which we call a roar which is this kind of very throaty big growl in fact I think they used an alligator roar as part of the t-rex roar for the sound mixing in jurassic park noise production in animals generally can be quite complicated certainly the bird thing so complex bird vocalizations that we associate with the more annoying exciting birds you know so so, you know songbirds and then the incredible mimicry of things like parrots and lyre birds and uh stuff like that um has some really complicated soft tissue it's a part of the um trachea the windpipe uh, called a syrinx and they have a very very complicated syrinx and that has a huge amount to do with what they can do that is a specialist bird thing the groups of birds which are close to the closest to the origin of birds from dinosaurs so things like ostriches kiwis chickens and ducks actually and some other things like this tend to make pretty simple sounds and don't have a complicated syrinx and don't make complicated sounds and indeed we have a fossil syrinx of a cretaceous (gasps) bird from antarctica so one has turned up and it's relatively simple so there's no reason to think that any of the dinosaurs had evolved some really complicated syrinx and could make super complicated sounds i do want you to realize though that after hearing all of this all i heard was the 
T-Rex quacked. That's all I heard. That's all I heard. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you did. That's one side of things. Um, on the other hand, that doesn't rule out some relative... I mean, when I say complicated, I mean, you know, Twittery songs and stuff. But again, listen to recordings of alligators and crocodiles. They're capable of making multiple discrete sounds. They do roars and hisses and growls and some others as well. Just because you've got a relatively simple vocal apparatus doesn't mean you can't make a bunch of sounds. But those are the kind of sounds, and again, duck-like quacks and honks, chicken-like clucks, um, you get some hisses in various birds. Those are the kind of sounds we are probably expecting most dinosaurs to make. Whether or not that included big roars, I don't know. I wouldn't be surprised. The bit that films always get wrong, of course, and every documentary ever, is animals that do that as part of their hunting. Documentaries in particular will have a, you know, a whole bunch of hadrosaurs going around eating and the T-Rex leaps out the bushes, stops, looks at them and goes, and then runs after them. And it's like, that is not a way to catch (laughs) dinner. (laughs) I'm coming to kill you. They will all (laughs) run away. (laughs) So don't do that. Uh, but again if a T-Rex is trying to fight another T-Rex and is trying to let it know that it's here and it's big and bad and you shouldn't fight it being able to make the biggest loudest deepest sound to show that you're a particularly large animal is probably a pretty good idea and so I'm you know they would have been making noises like this um, the ones that are worth talking about on a side note are some of the hadrosaurs so Parasaurolophus in particular so that's the one everyone knows with the big crest on the back of its head that looks like it's mm. got half a trombone stuck onto its bonds because it does the nasal passages so the nostrils are down at the front of the nose and they go up in over the eyes and all the way up that and all the way back down the other side and then back into the kind of sinuses and then would go down the throat so we're talking major major nasal twang here. yeah and you know a big parasaurolophus crest is like the thick end of a meter long so it's a meter up and then a meter back and then the stuff at the back and then the stuff down onto the nose there's a lot going on there Aww. yeah and you know the passage is six seven and eight centimetres across, you know, as a woodwind instrument on an animal that probably weighs a tonne and a half, two tonnes, it's going to make quite a row when it starts blowing air through that. And Does it have really big lungs, do we think, as well? Or... It's it's hard to know because, because we don't exactly know what we're, what it's doing with it. Um, and it could do cunning things like, yeah, have a big inflatable throat pouch, you could have big inflatable nose pouches or mm. something like this, which would either amplify or resonate or... Bagpipe it. Just be a massive bagpipe. They could could probably make some really serious noises and quite how complicated those might have been and it's not just parasaurolophus there's others too but Mm. that's probably the best one and the best example of people talked about it a lot um yeah they are probably chucking out a some serious decibels and b i wouldn't be at all surprised if they had some soft tissue apparatus which is allowing them to do some really interesting modifications which of course we can't spot from from the fossils Parasaurolophus is an interesting one in its own right because it's like this absolutely iconic dinosaur that's unbelievably rare. There's this really good skeleton of it, which is in Toronto, um, and there's casts of that skeleton or just the skull from that skeleton all over the place. Uh, like loads and loads and loads of different museums have it, and yet I think there's like three good Parasaurolophus Aww. skulls ever, and we've known about it for a century. It's <laughs> And, and hadrosaurs are really common normally. So it's annoying. It's, it's one of these absolute icons of which actually we really don't know very much because there's so few of them. We've probably got time for another couple of questions. So I'm just trying to work out which ones we should Oh, hang on. I, I didn't answer a question that was in there that you slipped in. Ha, have dinosaurs ever been accurately portrayed in film? Yeah, that's John wants to know that. Yeah, probably not really. So even allowing for, obviously, the science moves on and things change and yada 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 um, and, and le- even allowing for that the science can change really rapidly and filmmaking can often take two or three years and therefore things just subtly get out of date or what is brand new science hasn't necessarily reached Hollywood or whoever is making their films probably not the, the one I'd probably mention is the original film of Arthur Conan Doyle's The Lost World from something like 1918 or 1925 wow um, and I'm sure this is an apocryphal story but I can buy it allegedly because this was being done I think they started 
started on it while he was still writing the book he showed this to a bunch of people and went I've actually got some footage of real dinosaurs and allegedly they went yeah you have this is exactly what we think dinosaurs looked like um, and there's some of the first dinosaurs on film that they're, they're predated slightly by is it called Ghost of Hollow Mountain or something like that it's this really really old film that I have seen uh, and he's once again he's on YouTube because now it's out of copyright yay um, and yes some of the animation in that despite this being stop motion from the early 1900s is really I like my stop motion animation is really quite good and you've got some nice little things like Triceratops with a baby and the mum tries to defend the baby and thing you know really quite you know almost mammalian behaviours and you know not just rah, smashy smashy fighty fighty which is what you normally get <laughs> um, and I think for their contemporary time they are actually really really good so that would be my my best shot at that that would be your so remind me of the name of the film again it's it's just the lost world it was, the lost it was world. based on yeah. it's a it was a silent film based on conan doyle's book uh that sticks fairly closely to it though of course the runtime's like 25 30 minutes yeah so reese indigo asked a great question which is makes sense to me so dinosaurs were around much longer than we and mammals have been around is it possible that they could have become sentient before man became sentient and made small societies and used tools and had a language and perhaps even clothes and that all this stuff has been long destroyed by time so there's no evidence of it but could could they have evolved like us to make like proto humans, but dinosaur? Yeah, I'll, I'll deal with the second part of that first. Like, would there be any evidence of that? And the answer is, yeah, there would be. It's not that this would just vanish. Um, you know, the earliest tools that we'd expect any you know advanced tools, or, you know, would be stone tools. That you know, we we know that chimpanzees will make stone tools or, or use specific stones to do specific tasks. I think it's fairly. And again, if we're talking, of, if we're really talking about societies and civilizations that's going to be quite tools and things like that and they're going to preserve you know flint arrowheads and flint axe heads and um we've got flint axe the... heads that are nearly a million yeah. years old so they're, they're right. older all... than human species yeah right well because because they're flint and flint is yeah. almost indestructible as it is so yeah if you know and flint was around back then so we would find uh, sooner or later bones associated with houses and flint and you know we we can find now you can find evidence of forest fires in the fossil record back in into the Cretaceous because you get little wow. chunks of charcoal. If there were isolated pockets of, you know, a ring of stones with loads of charcoal in it and some arrowheads, well, that. Um, and we don't find anything like that for good reason because it ain't there. Aww. And and of course, actually, societies often live in areas which are great for preservation because they hang around in places like rivers because they want a water supply and this, that, and the other. Um, particularly if they're moving into agriculture, so they'd be in places that would get buried and would be preserved. Um, so I think we can happily rule that one out. The, could dinosaurs have ever become sentient? Well, the obvious answer is yeah, maybe, but they didn't show any particular evidence of pulling that off. Either over 175 million years so there's no particular reason to think that whatever selection pressures were going to drive it even further were ever going to kick in i mean you know yes parrots are extraordinarily clever so are things like new caledonian crows you know dolphins it's very hard to test their intelligence because they're dolphins and it's difficult to get them to do the kind of things that we'd normally test for tool users because they're dolphins uh chimps in particular orangutans are really really smart um but still you know this is relatively few species out of a huge number of species um, and even then obviously the only really good very sentient tool using structured society etc 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 maybe a couple of the other apes but basically just us you know and of course our various hominid ancestors um, so it clearly requires quite an unusual or even unique set of circumstances for the evolutionary selective pressures to start pushing intelligence more and more and more and more and more until you get something like that. And really, if you look at the reason we have the intelligence, it is just a byproduct of communication. So the way that we've learned to survive, like the brain, it uses 20% of our yes, energy. It's, a it's hugely expensive. And it's not like you need like a level of intelligence to survive. Many animals, most every other species is not as clever as humans. Yeah. And I'm a big fan of Robin Dunbar and his 
whole reason about why we have such an expensive brain that requires all these proteins and all these fats is simply because we have a very large social group which demands that we talk to each other. Because we're not like macaques, we're not like chimps, we can't groom each other. If we groomed each other, it would take far too long. How we groom each other, and me and Dave are grooming you right now... (laughs) <laughs> we are chatting. This is what we do. This is how we form these bonds. And so we have this really complex language. That is why we have this demand, this huge brain, is because in order to have this language, in order to be able to constantly groom each other, to sit round a fire and talk, is that you need to be able, in order to understand language, to go through steps, a bit like you do when you're making IKEA furniture. You sort of have to follow the steps in order to make sense of the sentence. But Mm -hmm. also what that allows the human species to do is to follow the steps as to create things. So you have to be able to say, okay, A follows B follows C, but that's the same logical steps as following a story. It's such an unusual adaptation. I think in order for a dinosaur, the, the pressure in order for a dinosaur to have to adapt us. You know, we often think of intelligence as this thing, which is the point of everything, because it's what we understand. But it's probably just a byproduct of survival. Part of the reason we had this pressure to be able to have such large groups. I mean, Robin Dunbar says that the Dunbar's number is 150. That is the amount of people you are capable of communicating with, knowing their names, knowing their details, having a relationship with. And we need to be able to communicate, and communicating requires certain steps. You know, when we're relaying really intricate detail. And it's that what gives us our intelligence. And as a byproduct, we don't really need an iPhone, you know, to survive. <laughs> well, I don't know. It's quite handy. <laughs> we don't need to know, like, about the Andromeda galaxy or even dinosaurs. Shh, shh, what we don't, need... tell them, don't tell them. No, no, they do need to know about dinosaurs. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> But we need to be able to look, to chat to each other. And in order to be able to chat to each other and to keep our group coordinated and everything happy and the food coming in and the you know babies coming out and all the rest of it, you need this really expensive organ of a brain. And the only way you can support that is to be able to have all the structures involved in that. So it's a sort of, it's such a unique circumstance where you need to generate that. It's such an expensive adaptation in terms of energy. It's really inefficient being human, really, when you yeah. think about it. So yeah, v- v- very long story story short yeah maybe maybe it could have happened to them eventually but it seems extraordinarily unlikely that it would have done i promise you you'd be much happier just as a silly little you know triceratops on your own fighting other triceratops whoops there's a bit of a t-rex never mind not really thinking about anything than you would being a modern human with all the pressures and knowing everything and oh what is a silly thing to adapt for okay so let's have one final question Harry's is a really lovely question because I don't I would never have thought anybody would even ask this question it's so it's so sweet it says what can I do to support cool paleontology research what projects would you recommend I support I think that's such a lovely question because it's not something I'd have thought that you know I'd go to a museum can you do more than uh, that? yeah you can I mean obviously it depends where you are and what's available and what's accessible um, but yeah there's all kinds of stuff that can be done and obviously hopefully we've got lots of listeners who are becoming interested in that kind of thing. Primary research, there are a few researchers who've put out um, either crowdfunded projects, so they're, let's be honest, straight up looking for money to go and do some research because the funding isn't available. I did that once years ago. I was very generously supported by a whole bunch of people to go to Canada and see a Despletosaurus fossil and, and work on that. A what? Despletosaurus. A, a, very, a very close relative of T-Rex. It's another big Tyrannosaur. Okay. So, so those are available and there are citizen science projects where it's not about money but it's about, you know, time and effort and can you check this data? Can you look through these databases for us? Can you, you know, help us tra- translation for people who speak other languages? They, I don't know if it operates anymore because the guy who set it up unfortunately passed away relatively young. Um, but there was the, a website called the Polyglot Paleontologist where people would translate scientific literature because although the modern international language of science is English, A, there are still other people writing in other languages and B, a lot of historical important papers were written in whatever local languages and people would translate these, which of course is enormous 
enormously important. Um, you know, however much of a polyglot you may be, you know, if you're someone like me who works on pterosaurs, there is pretty critical research done by the Chinese and the Germans and the Brazilians. And it's like, well, I don't speak Chinese and I don't speak German and I don't speak Portuguese. So it's really hard to read that literature. And so someone who <laughs> translates those papers and, and well, I uh, mean, you know, it's a reliable source of data. It's absolutely fantastic. So stuff like that is, is always going to be an option. To be honest, let's talk about money. You know, people are looking for money right now with all the lockdowns going on in, you know, all kinds of countries. You know, yeah, yes, there are big, you know, national museums, which are, you know, effectively run or sponsored by the, you know, the government or the, you know, the public purse. They're probably going to be all right, though they may well be hurting. Um, but there are tons and tons of small museums which are either private or are just provincial. They're run by some local state or county or province or whatever. And they have no money at the best of times. And now they've just been cut off from all their visitors for multiple months. There are loads of them who are appealing for donations. So if people have money and you want to support your local one, you know, just send them a donation or as soon as they open up, make sure that you you go. Um, And then, yeah, associated projects like that. There are all kinds of, again, particularly small museums who want volunteers, people who can ideally come in and help with, often it's often it's basic jobs. And of course, it, people go, oh, it's really exciting. I'm going to go and work in a museum. And it's like, what we really want you to do is sort out all these boxes of rocks because that stuff needs doing <laughs> and we just haven't got time to do it. And I'm afraid until you've done quite a lot of rock sorting, we're not going to let you loose on the delicate, expensive, rare, valuable dinosaur <sighs> fossils. Um, but, you know, but that's how it, but that stuff is still valuable because it makes a real contribution. And there are people who have ultimately ended up making careers out of doing stuff like that. You know, they started off by being a volunteer and then they got really into it and they were invited to do more stuff. And then they got involved in some actual primary research and published a paper. And so they went and did a PhD because now they demonstrated they could do science. And that really happens. Um, and yeah, people do things like photography. You know, as a, as a paleontologist, you have to basically do everything. So I have to be able to take photographs and I have to be able to do scientific illustrations and stuff like that. And I'm not very good at it. And so other people who are willing to give up their time to help me out, they will do a much better job of it than I will in a fraction of the time, which saves me time to get on with doing other things that I am better at, like producing papers. Um, and so assistance in, in that can help enormously. But basically, have a look online and again, find the nearest museum to you and offer your services or engage with researchers like me who are online and periodically put a shout out going, I'm looking for someone if someone can help with this, that would be lovely. And if you're willing to give you up your time and you have some expertise in image manipulation or photographing or building websites or editing files or anything, you are likely to be very useful indeed. Oh, well, see, there we go. So it's not just also, of course, I should add to all of this because she says always wanting help with the because this this podcast we are not being paid for uh, and we are um, doing it because we love dinosaurs and you love dinosaurs and you need to find out more about them. So if you want to support us, please do go to Patreon. At the moment, when I'm, I'm recording this, we have 10 people. If you've joined you know, in the last week or so, I might not mention your name, but um, no, I love you anyway. But thank you to Scott. Thank you to Chris. Thank you to Justine. Thank you to Lee. Thank you to Robert. Thank you to Jim. Thank you to Lee. Thank you to Eric. Thank you to Karen. Thank you to Harry. <gasps> My goodness, what a lot of people. It makes me feel so happy that I'm not screaming into a void. And like I say, me and Dave are not receiving any finance for this and that is now paying for our um podcast hosting so that's absolutely amazing uh so yay thank you and like i say there will be special episodes going out in the break and we're going to have a bit of a break we're going to come back in september is the current plan with a whole new series Mm -hmm. once again we've got we've got planning the series out a bit but if you have suggestions do email us do um tweet us and everything else also thank you to everybody who's been sending us artwork in particular people like sam people like ted people like chris that's chris riddell uh also um ivan he's only seven years old um he's esther's son he's in italy he's absolutely amazing Matina on um, Twitter which is M-E-T-T-I-I-N-A um, she's utterly fantastic she's been doing loads of the drawings so keep sending us your drawings keep following us on Twitter a big thank you to everybody there and we will be back in September um, and we will you know we'll make sure you won't miss it you won't you won't you don't want to miss a thing I feel I've got an yes, error yeah I was going to say <laughs> yeah 
don't want to be sick. Um, but no, um, hopefully we've asked, answered some, not all of your questions, but we went on too long again. This is the, this is the issue. I'm going to make sure this one's under an hour, though. I'm going yes. to make sure. Uh, yeah, every, 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 I've, I've, I've pulled Izzy up on this. Every episode we've done to date has been longer than the last one. They're like 57 minutes, 59 minutes, 101, 102, 104. And Damn. if you're not careful by the fourth or fifth season, we are doing four-hour episodes. <laughs> I know. Okay, I will. I'll, keep, I'll trim it down. It'll be good. But do you have any messages for anybody, Dave, that you want to say at the end of this? No, just just the same general message. Thank you very much to everyone because we started this not knowing how well it was going to be received and not knowing quite how it was going to work. Even yeah, the response has been absolutely fantastic. And yeah, if this had gone yeah. really badly, I think we wouldn't have been contemplating a second series instead of that was, instead of the fact that we're now it. already planning a second one and the in between Patreon on bonus episode or two to fill in that gap and then we need to yeah. <laughs> we need to find time to record the damn thing as well it'll be fine it'll be fine it'll be fine, yeah, we'll, we'll, be fine. We'll, we'll make it we'll work be, we'll be hopefully. good <laughs> Have a lovely summer, guys. Um, I hope I hope you are safe and everything else because it is obviously twenty twenty. We're recording this. COVID is still, you know, a thing. But um, yeah, hopefully you guys will be all right, and uh, we'll see you in September. Bye. Did you nearly say bye? You nearly ruined. I said say bye. You are a fool, sir. A fool. Yeah, I know. Well, we haven't recorded for about four weeks, so I forgot. <laughs> Thank you for listening to the Terrible Lizards podcast. Do you have a dinosaur question for Dave? Email terriblelizardspod at gmail.com and we'll answer it in a future episode. To support the show, please leave a review on your podcast app and tell your friends about it. To find out more about us and to donate, visit terriblelizards.co.uk. Are you a dinosaur fan? Let us know. Follow Izzy Lawrence and Dave Hone on Twitter. That's at I-S-Z-I-L-A-W-R-E-N-C-E and at Dave Hone, D-A-V-E underscore H-O-N-E. Include the hashtag Terrible Lizards. Find us on Facebook at Terrible Lizards Podcast. We'll see you next time.